The original Alien movie is one of the most psychologically intense and multi-layered movies ever made. And while many of you who are fans of it might not have an interest in playing video games, I highly recommend you at least take a look at some gameplay footage of Alien Isolation. Of all the Alien franchise sequels, prequels and Predator cross-pollinations, this game does the best job of capturing and expanding upon the sophisticated psychology of the original film. To illustrate how well the game does this, I'm going to break down in this video one of my favourite sequences from the game, which will include this cinematic cutscene. We'll be exploring environment, sound design, lighting and more as we discover just how deep, complex and brutal this game's psychology is. First though, let me give you a brief overview of the sequence. Amanda Ripley, daughter of Ellen Ripley from the original Alien movie, has found herself in a similar predicament to her mother, trapped on a huge ship with an alien. She's been tasked with trying to trap the alien in the laboratory section of the spaceship that is detachable. Once the alien is trapped in there, the lab can be blasted off into space, where it will plummet into a nearby gas giant planet, a planet which looks very similar to the one that we saw in the first movie. To achieve this, Ripley has to sneak through the lab and switch on its power while avoiding being detected and killed by the alien. Then she has to escape the lab and get back onto the larger ship so as not to die herself. But Ripley is betrayed by her human intercom guide. She's locked in, the lab is detached with her and the alien on it. Stuck on the spinning detached lab and still being hunted by the alien, she has to acquire a spacesuit and eject herself out of the hatch and back toward the larger vessel that she was originally trying to get back to. And she just about makes it. The whole sequence is really unnerving, not just because of the well thought out plot scenario, but also on account of the relentless onslaught of subliminal communication and other non-verbal details. Before we start though, I'll add a few more contextual points. The footage you're about to see isn't what you would expect from a normal playthrough. Instead of just pursuing the plot based goal of the level, I'll be hanging about in the sets to take in the many details of visual and sound design so that we can explore their implications. A lot of these details will just seem incidental in a normal playthrough, the point being that you're not supposed to consciously notice them, they're supposed to play on you subliminally instead. And often this involves multiple subtle details bombarding the player at the same time for a potent hypnotic effect. In order to draw out as much detail from the sequence as possible, I recorded a few playthroughs, each taking a slightly different gameplay approach and each drawing attention to different aspects of the experience. So my walkthrough of the level will be a combination of clips from each of those recordings. Some of you might be confused by the interpretations I'm going to offer, especially if you're not used to raw sensory analysis and you tend to just take movies and game experiences on a purely verbal plot point level. But this game is famous for having creepy and atmospheric visuals and sound effects that are lacking in most other games, even in most other horror games. That persistent emotional atmosphere, as many call it, doesn't occur by accident. It is the specific sensory details that create and maintain the strong emotional impact. So that's what we're going to explore. Oh, one more thing. With this video and my channel as a whole, which is non-corporate and is not monetized for advertising revenue, you get original studies of movies and games and other media. This isn't one of those rehash channels where the creators have simply plucked snippets of already existing information from other online sources or other videos from YouTubers and simply compiled them into a new presentation. Here you get original observations and interpretations, not rehashing. So if you're new to my work, make sure to subscribe and visit my website collativelearning.com for a ton of additional content. Right, so let's take a walk through the sequence from beginning to end and break it all down as best we can. When we're done, I'll finish this video by letting one of my playthroughs of the level run on its own and in its entirety without any narration. That way you can take the observations gathered in the course of the video and explore them as an integrated chronological experience. Starting off, we head through a connecting tunnel to the detachable laboratory. It's dark and organic looking, like we're walking down the alien's throat. Organic looking interiors were present in the original movie both on the alien ship and the Nostromo, as if the ships were giant living beasts. This door opens and multiple visual themes are present in the first few seconds. The door and the interior that follows have an emphasis on the colour red. Strong colours are rare in this game and when they do make an appearance it's usually red, which of course we associate with blood, danger, sexuality among other things. 
But I think in this game, the subliminal impression of blood-splattered sets is what the emphasis on red is more about. This interpretation, I think, is supported here by the top half of an android body that has been ripped in two. It's positioned so that the red floor area starts where the android's white blood is spilling out. It gives me the impression of the area being splattered with red blood from this half body. And the chipped and flaky paint adds to this impression. Also, this half android could be one of the game's occasional nods to Jim Cameron's sequel movie Aliens, from which this game also takes its motion tracker designs. Up above, a tangled mesh of ribbed pipes with a thick one in the middle. To me, this looks like one of the game's many subliminal impressions of the alien itself hiding silently among the set details. This one ready to pounce on the player from above, but also giving the impression of a much larger alien. We can even hear the actual alien climbing about in the ventilation shafts above as we encounter this little set piece. As we get closer, we can see there is a hole right there for the alien to come out and attack from this very place. It almost looks like this place is turning into an alien nest as well. The wall of bright light and tiny aligned strips here on the left seems to be drawn from this scene in the original film. Strange, complex and unnerving mathematical designs are frequent in the sets of Alien and Alien Isolation. There won't be too much of that in this video, but look elsewhere in the game and you'll find tons of it. But this instance also is an example of extreme contrast between light and dark areas of the game. Areas of darkness followed by a sudden burst of brightness. This is uncomfortable to our eyes, adding to the general sense of unease. This happens a lot in this game. What we see through this window is where we need to get to to repower the lab. Looking about a bit more, we have dark sets with faintly detectable details. We know there's things there in the darkness but aren't quite sure what they are. Could be the alien whose physical details are mimicked in a lot of the ship's environments. For example, these smooth pipes in a row of three. At a passing glance, that could be the alien, curled up in the wall like it did at the end of the first movie. Hearing the alien pop out somewhere, it has a rattlesnake sounding hiss that I don't think was used in the first film, but I like it. And there it is, creeping up in the distance, so let's drop into here for safety. Dark tunnels and more details reminiscent of the alien's physical features, then a big imposing yellow eye-like feature staring at us in the dark. Giant, subliminal watching guys are present in most of the air shafts of this game, and it was present in the original movie. These moments of hiding and looking up beneath grated floor panels seems to be another element inspired by Cameron's sequel movie Aliens. I'm glad they took a lot from that film because it's easy to forget what a good movie that was, even though horror wasn't its main emphasis. But what do we find in this level if we don't go under the floor and instead make our way out in the open? A subtle detail here used in many parts of the game is the quiet plumes of smoke or dry ice or whatever it is seeping out from pipes and vents in the source of machinery. These often supply a little bit of animation to the otherwise lifeless set, while also making it harder in places to make out exactly what is there in the darkness. At times in this game, these little plumes of smoke make it feel like the ship is almost breathing. A rotating blue light from above casts moving shadows as well, further animating this set and potentially providing cover for any movements by the alien. External views of the large space station give an indication of its colossal size. The insignificant size of the player is a major psychological factor throughout this game both in the environments and the player in relation to the alien, which is really tall. Now look at this gorgeous piece of subliminal set design. Remind you of anything? Take a moment. And personally, I see multiple things. It looks to me like a surrealist impression of a giant black face hugger or some other spidery type creature, but also the two circles just below the center with vertical slits look like eyes, and the area below that looks like a big mouth stretched open and ready to bite or swallow. Going with the face interpretation, the multiple extending pipes give the face a Medusa-like appearance, or perhaps they could be like tentacles. 
I think the original alien creature designer H.R. Giger would have liked this piece of design work, especially being that it bears similarity to some of his own other paintings. In terms of sound, we get various ship noises here and there that help disguise some of the noises the alien makes when it moves about. Just like the black and semi-organic looking set designs provide the alien with camouflage opportunities. Let's go back to the tunnel version of my playthrough. Switching the torch on in tunnels typically reveals details similar to the alien's ribbed and smooth pipe features as it often does in the open areas. Dead end here, so let's turn around. Look at the map, we've got a fair way to go, right around the perimeter before we can access the lab. More of those trippy mathematical patterns I mentioned earlier, this time in the form of light shining through a grill. The game often uses jagged and harsh light and shadows for a gothic effect. More giant eyes watching us down different tunnel paths. The tunnel comes to an end so we have to climb out from safety into an open but very dark area and the ship seems to make a mysterious hissing noise, as if it was timed for this point in the journey. The ship noises not only often disguise the alien when it is there, but sometimes also gives the momentary impression of the alien being right up close even though it isn't. This subliminal approach is much better than traditional jump scares which are too obvious. I guess we could call these more subtle variations anxiety commands. So we're going to make our way around and check out some more set details, but what's that? A view of space, let's take a look. And note how the moving shadows up there create a sense of anxiety by momentarily appearing to be the alien itself moving about. At least that's what I thought when I noticed it while playing. Sneaking around to the window, there are more unnerving geometric patterns in this wall, specifically lit to have an emotional impact. The windows themselves protrude outward in most instances of this game. Aside from that design appearing at a couple of moments in the first movie, I think the reason for this being used so much in this game, in terms of atmospherics, is so that the player can step forward and see up and down and experience the anxiety of potentially falling out into the terrifying black void of space. That was something important in the original film. The alien wasn't the only threat, it was one of many, with the deathly black emptiness of space being one of those threats that is present aesthetically but was never talked about in the movie. Looking out, we can see a dimly lit portion of the much larger ship that we'll need to get back to, and a couple of dimly lit moons. Something strange here is that the actual light source is missing. There's no bright star position to light those planets, and there is no such orange light shining through the window into this set. So I don't know if that is a deliberate lighting omission or just a mistake. Probably a mistake. By the way, I like the issue in this game that the motion tracker can identify where the alien is when it's actually moving, but using the motion tracker involves making a noise that can also attract the creature, so the player is caught between two conflicting anxieties. Flicking back and forth between the map screen, note the trippy geometric patterns and flashes of white light during the transition. These add to the feeling of unease. Let's slow them down to a quarter speed and take a closer look. Another very subtle visual factor is that when we use the motion tracker, it comes into focus while distant set details become blurred or fuzzy. So I think at a lot of points in this game, looking at the motion tracker has a subliminal transformative effect upon the environment. The sets going out of focus sometimes makes the details take on the impression of an out of focus alien or some other threatening entity. Plus the focus shift is generally quite hypnotic, especially when strong lights and smoke are involved. Some nice views of the alien here. It's tall enough that it typically has to crouch slightly to move through a lot of standard height sets in this game. Size was always a major scare factor in the alien design, but also in this game, but not in the original film, heavy footstep sounds gives the creature a sense of weight. Tall and heavy as the beast. Now another of those giant mechanical face impressions. 
There are several of these placed around the perimeter of the lab, so it's like whichever way we go, that big subliminal alien face is always nearby, suspended in a lunging, biting manner. More of that creepy crisscross pipe work, which the alien hid behind near the end of the movie. And what's this? Rays of bright light? What's going on there? First though, let's have a look at the meshwork of struts above, which at this point have become blood red, like organic tendons. And we have ribbed pipes up there again, uh, giving an impression of the alien lurking above, ready to drop down and attack. The whole image up there looks almost to me like a spider in a web. Looking into that mysterious bright doorway, we have a sun shining right at us. Another of the game's sudden shifts from darkness to harsh light. And the way it's positioned in the centre seems unnatural, like it's a big eye staring right into the ship. That bright sun is also a nice distraction to catch us off guard for what happens next. Another bright-eyed threat. Looking up through the windows above, the massive height of the larger space station is evident. We have another here of those subliminal giant alien faces. Back to the tunnel version of my playthrough. We're into the next tunnel where we find more spiral eyes. Taking a look up, the windows above give us a view of the colossal gas giant planet, itself a terrifying beast that plays an essential role in this sequence. Note that it's almost completely in darkness like that creepy opening shot of the alien movie. Lots of creaking in the shaft as we move, potentially drawing the alien's attention. Now another example of the game shifting us from periods of darkness into sudden bright light for an unsettling effect. The sound is sneaky here too. As soon as we walk into that sunlight, an energy drone is heard as if it's the power of the sun. A terrifying beast much larger than even the gas giant planet. There's two suns, and both shining so brightly upon the player and the set as to appear threatening. But the size of the gas giant is evident by the fact that an entire world sits between it and us, and it looks like an Earth-type world. This is one of the game's moments where we're made to feel tinier than a grain of sand, and the original movie had moments of that too. We also get to see here in the glare of sunlight just how detailed the interior sets are. Now if you're wondering why the alien hasn't made much of an effort to attack me so far in this level, it's because I'm playing on easy mode, so that I can explore the sets without being constantly killed. But also maybe the alien has taken a narrative backseat on purpose to let the environmental details go to work on us in a hypnotic sense. Here for example, three pipes with a prominent centre one, like a mini alien built into the wall. This kind of triple pipe arrangement is frequent in the game. Up the stairs now, passing railings that look more like rib cages, and into our target destination room. Equations on a board, which of course we would expect in a lab, but there is a theme in the visuals of this game, and in the original movie, of a scary, complex, hidden reality behind our experience. It's present in the ultra-detailed set designs, the complex machinery, wiring and computer panels, and it's there in the computer data displays, and the scientific jargon of the android character Ash. There's in a nitrogen high concentration of carbon dioxide crystals, methane, I'm working on the trace elements. And here we have it in mysterious equation form, along with paperwork and mysterious instruments. Imposing visual complexity is especially important in this game. Earlier I talked about the importance of the colour red in the sets. Well, I don't think I've ever seen a red fan anywhere. But here we have one, and this prop appears in multiple sets of the game, and it's always in red. The fact that it's switched on draws our attention to it. And we have other bits of red in this room, like wires, boxes, and fire extinguishers, plus a fair amount of blood dripping down from a hatch. Looks like the alien pulled the scientists up there and slaughtered them, eh? Boo-hoo. Right, so there's the window we saw through when we first entered this detachable lab. Pull a lever to accomplish the first step in the mission, and time to escape. 
One of the game's many harsh screechy noises is included with the pulling of the lever. And also the physical struggle of pulling stiff levers adds emotional tension as it did in the first movie. Now we get alarms and other mechanical noises kicking in. That's it. I can see a power spike. As we try to escape, the game has set us up so that exiting this door brings us briefly head on with that giant alien face design. And hey look, it's even breathing out smog from the mouth area now. Plenty of sensory distractions provide cover for the alien's movements, like in the ending of the first movie. Hazardous material leak detected. Now our intercom guide tells us to head back through to another part of the lab that's just been powered up, so a bit of backtracking. Well first let's take advantage of the bright sunlight here to lure the alien in for a, a self-sacrificial kill where we can get a look at its finer details. By passing the set repetition, we get to the computer console eventually and find more emphasis on the colour red. To access the console, we have to go through a very basic visual puzzle interface. These come in various forms throughout the game. They're not difficult, and at times they just seem like a boring distraction, but I think the point of them is their trippy hypnotic effect. The flashes of rich light and colour play tricks on the eyes, but also having to do these little interface puzzles while standing out in the open as the alien is lurking about in the sets, that is very unnerving in places too, especially here. I don't think an alien has ever attacked me mid-puzzle in this game, but the game presents that anxiety anyway. Making our way out to try and escape the area, the alien cuts off our path on this attempt. It sees us, and trying to run from the alien once it's seen you in this game is usually pointless, it virtually always kills you. But this time, I escape into the tunnels below. But the smart AI of the creature kicks in, and a few moments later I suddenly get dragged from the tunnel and killed. It looks like it remembered I was down there, and I think it might have even pulled up a floor panel to get to me. Like in Cameron's movie. Just to showcase the unusually smart AI again, on my next attempt, I hid under this table, and being low on flamethrower fuel, I kept a Molotov ready to throw. But the alien sees the flame, realises I'm under the table, and instead of going straight at me where I can throw the Molotov at it and burn it, it runs round the desk and flanks me at lightning speed. Hello face, meet Fangs. <laughs> Next attempt I took the safe option and stuck in the tunnels. The throbbing lights thing is good because it plunges us into darkness every couple of seconds and has a generally hypnotic effect. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Lots of hissing pipes that sound like the hissing alien or hissing snake. About to escape we get locked in and here's where the anxiety level really starts to ramp up with the short cutscene. First of all listen to the threatening sound effects reminiscent of rattlesnakes. The separation of the lab from the main ship could have just been a boring unlock and attach affair, but not this one. A flash explosion, harsh on the eyes, and a sound effect harsh on the ears to match. Don't fucking do this to me. 
We very briefly here get to see that the detached lab is not only falling off toward the gas giant planet, but is also spinning along the way. Disorientation was a factor in the first film, with the maze of dark hallways and the distraction of smoke jets and flashing and spinning lights. But this sequence takes that sense of physical disorientation off to new levels. First, anti-gravity within the ship, during which our hands touch upon some of those big pipes that mimic the design of the creature itself. Hey, they're even in the same colours as the alien. Listen to the dense layering of sound here too. A panic-inducing siren, assorted hissing and groaning noises from the ship, some of which grate on the ear, and a heartbeat layered on top of that once the gravity is switched back on. Getting back up, the gravity seems to be off kilter on account of the ship spinning. Nice touch. Now I'm going for an out in the open path to the escape hatch so that we can get the full visual effect of the ship spinning toward the gas giant. Spinning stars, moons and the gas giant itself combined with tilted gravity of the station. So we have major dizziness combined with the threat of the alien, which we can still hear roaming about somewhere above. And even if we survive the alien, that big gaping black hole of a planet is due to swallow us up anyway. It's like a big mouth in itself. The gravity tilt sways about like we're on a ship in a storm. And oh, there's that creepy face design again. There's the alien silhouette, but strobe lights make it hard to keep track of where it is. Meanwhile, the double threat of that big planet spinning above and toward us. Now we need to get to that door, but if we stand out in the open, the strobe lights will highlight us for the alien to see, so let's sneak in the shafts for a moment. By the way, somewhere along our path here, the alarm siren changed to a more harsher sounding version. Sneaking out into the open area, the blood red area, and press the button to prepare the escape hatch, which we have to wait for. More harsh sound effects and another siren kicks in, overlapping the one that's already playing. So we need to hide in the floor again for a moment for the uh, escape hatch to prepare itself. I don't know what's going on in there. More hissing smog and music now adding to the multi-layered sound. Nice views of the alien in waiting. In one of my playthroughs I waited out in the open to see what the alien would get up to. But there are so many visual and auditory distractions I forgot to reload my flamethrower fuel and got wiped out. Nice little view of the alien face though, revealing the hollow skull eyes beneath the forehead dome. That was always part of the original alien design, but it didn't get showcased in the first movie. A shame because it gives the alien an even more deathly look. By the way, in another playthrough I was watching the alien through the floor, and as it moved about, it kept pushing the body of the android around the place, the one that grabbed at me earlier. Its tail kept moving the android over the floor grid, which I thought was kind of creepy. Switching over to another playthrough, the escape hatch door opens but the alien goes in there, so I've got to wait for it to come back out. Off it goes, so time to get the hell out of here, as they say. Now as we run in there and switch to a cinematic cut sequence, there's one little detail which you might think nothing of, but it was something I picked up on at the end of the first movie. See the little black axe on the wall next to half-naked Ripley? I spotted that and I was amused at the fact that the alien with its long head is shaped a bit like an axe. And I wondered if that detail was one of the, the film's many intended subliminals, just constant reminders of the alien presence. I also know that the makers of this game, uh, they talked extensively with Terry Rawlings who edited the original Alien film and he explained a lot of the film's psychology to them. They said that in one of their interviews. The team were also given access to a huge amount of production materials from Alien. 
that have never been published, and this is partially why the Alien Isolation game is so accurate to the original vision. So this game includes a lot of set details that were present in the original movie production, but didn't make it into the final edit of the movie, or if they did make it in, they were only distant details in the background. This game allows us to see those things up close the way they were intended in the original film. And that's why it's so important for fans of the franchise to explore this game, even if they don't like video games. But anyway, the axe. In this escape sequence, a similar small axe just happens to be laying on the floor in the escape hatch, and it's made very prominent in what has just become a cinematic cut sequence. This axe has nothing to do with what happens narratively here, so I suspect it's a repeat of the same little subliminal axe being used here in the original movie. So anyway, Ripley shuts the door just on time to stop the alien. And a quick note about the doors. See the teeth-like designs along the edges and the eye-like designs near the top? Doors as subliminal representations of the alien face and teeth are incredibly frequent in this game and in the original Alien movie. Don't believe me? Play through the game and pay attention to the various door designs. Here, the threat and the scream of the alien is combined with one of those doorways. But we're not done yet, the cut sequence continues. Red lighting and panic alarm as Ripley gets her suit on, being that she is about to be ejected into space. The mouth-like door opens and we're sucked out. Initially it looks like we're being sucked right towards one of the planet's moons, but the timing is fortunate enough to fly us right at the station that we want to get back to. Very lucky timing, considering the lab was spinning quite fast. Ripley would almost certainly just bounce back into the void upon hitting the station, but hey, this is fantasy, so let's go with it. Lots of spinning disorientation, lots of views of the terrifying black mouth of the gas giant planet, Lots of grabbing onto spaceship features that are similar to the alien details, like when we were in anti-gravity inside the lab. And the condensation on the helmet and the visual distortion at the sides of the glass adds to the sense of visual confusion. Again, trippy, hypnotic. Ripley is lucky enough to have grabbed onto the ship very close to an entry hatch. <laughs> Finish with the hostile hiss of the closing door as we get back inside. <laughs> and end of level. So, what a brilliant and unnerving sequence this detachable lab mission is. Imagine if this were a movie and it was designed and directed as well as the game is. I think this could have been on par with the first two movies. Importantly, it's not just about the direct threat of the alien at the plot level, it's about physical dizziness and disorientation. It's about overload of the eyes and ears with complexity, and moments of unpleasant brightness and ear-piercing sound. And it's about subliminal communication on par with hypnosis, using the kinds of symbols and metaphors typically found in our dreams and nightmares. Most feature films, never mind games, don't have anywhere near this level of sophistication. The competition tends to rely on jump scares, which requires no imagination to do. Just bore the audience with nothing happening for a minute or two, and then hit them with a blast of visual movement and sound. Repeat that dumb process a couple of dozen times, and apparently that constitutes a horror movie today. No, subliminal communication is where the best horror films and games make their mark. If you want to produce quality horror, Studying and using hypnosis in the sensory aesthetics is the best way to go. To finish this video off, I'm going to let one of my playthroughs of the level run its course without narration for you to watch and notice how a lot of this stuff fits together as a casual experience. But first I'm going to plug some more of my content. If you're new to my work, I have lots of studies of movies and a growing collection of video game studies. Doom, Skyrim, The Witness, GTA V, Mirror's Edge and Far Cry 5. I've got videos on all of those, 
and I've got new videos on the way uh, regarding both Alien Isolation and Mirror's Edge. All of those are currently in writing. So have a watch of those videos and make sure to subscribe and click the notification button. Otherwise, YouTube won't inform you of my latest uploads. You'll miss out. If you've exhausted my collection of videos on YouTube, then go to my website, collativelearning.com, where you'll find lots of free extensive articles, especially on the films of Stanley Kubrick. And you'll also find a huge backlog of paywall-only videos and articles, which can be ordered and downloaded individually. If you can't afford the downloads, then you can sign up to support me with a small monthly donation on Patreon, which will gain you access to about 12 hours of additional videos that are not available on YouTube. Thanks for watching, folks. You've been listening to Rob Ager of collativelearning.com. And now, here's the playthrough.
Spike. Now, reconnect the lab systems to Sebastopol from the console in the central lab. We're counting on you, Ripley. Hazardous material being detected.
That's it. I can see a power spike. Now, reconnect the lab systems to Sebastopol from the console in the central lab. We're counting on you, Ripley. Hazardous material leak detected.
I'm sorry, Ripley. Lock pressure is 